Thank you all for being here this evening. The consent agenda <clears throat> is that I, we put items of uh, routine and non-controversial nature on the consent agenda to allow the Board of Education to focus on other items contained in the length, lengthy agenda. I well, move to approve the consent agenda. One second. Thank you. Any comments or discussion? <laughs> Missy? Hey. My apologies. <coughs> Mr. Almanza? Aye. Mrs. Alter? Aye. Mrs. Cacciarella? Aye. Mrs. Jarno? Aye. Dr. Long? Aye. Mrs. Decker? Aye. Mrs. Tivarkunis? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Thank you. Excellent. And then we do not have any public participation this evening. Uh, have we, so we'll move right on to the report of the superintendent. All right, I think I'm ready here. Let me back this up. All right. Well, I need to uh, start the meeting, unfortunately, on a, on a sad note. I do think it's important that we acknowledge uh, the recent loss of uh, Patricia Rowe. Um, Patty was lost in an incident last Friday in, in Gypsum and was the mother of two students in our system. Um, and her husband, uh, Michael, uh, continues to be active in our community and is, is friends with many uh, of the administrators on our team. So uh, I just wanted to pass along our condolences to the Rowe family and to let them know that uh, we're, we're saddened by the loss of, of Patty and we stand ready to assist the family in every way that we can. I know that the communities at Gypsum Creek Middle School and, and Red Hill Elementary School uh, where their children attend uh, have been supported by the Hope Center therapists and by our own Eagle County Schools counselors who have been able to, to provide uh, assistance for them as they mourn and try to navigate this, this difficult time. Uh, but I did want them to know they're, they're in our thoughts and that we're ready to, to help them in any way that we can. So moving on to more uh, happier news, um, I wanted to make sure the board was aware that uh, Julieta Cavallo, who is a kindergarten teacher at Edwards Elementary School, has been awarded the Colorado Bilingual Teacher of the Year Award. This is quite prestigious. <clears throat> quite prestigious uh, award. Uh, Huli's been with us for 15 years in Eagle County, uh, and it's uh, really her tireless outreach to families and her assistance beyond the classroom that, that uh, prompted her, her principal, Matt Abramowitz, to nominate her for this award. So uh, the hours that she puts in are unbelievable and her dedication to her students and to the school and then the whole community of Edwards is really tremendous. So we're fortunate uh, and, and grateful for her service and proud to say that she's part of the ECSD team. Uh, so I wanted to say publicly congratulations uh, to Huli. And that's a picture of, of her and I Monday morning, I showed up with flowers and a, and a gift card uh, to say thank you to her and congratulations. And that photo was taken by one of her kindergartners, uh, who, who, uh, who's also a friend of mine that I know from the neighborhood. So, um, Ollie, good job on the picture. <clears throat> All right, uh, recent activities. I attended the superintendent conference that Case holds in the fall. Uh, it was last week in Breckenridge. I was there Thursday, planned on being there till on Friday, but uh, incidents that, that transpired uh, brought me back a little bit early. But I, I could say that about a third of the superintendents were present, mostly focused on sharing challenges and solutions that all districts are, are trying to navigate in this difficult time. I think my key takeaway from that meeting is that Eagle County School District is, is well ahead of the state curve if there is a curve. Uh, many of the superintendents that I sat with are still operating in the remote model in their school districts. They haven't even contemplated how to come back in person yet. And we've got four weeks under our belt, uh, coming into five weeks here of, of having schools open and kids working with teachers in schools. I, I know it's a limited in-person model, but it's in-person and we're excited that we've been able to offer that. And it was inspiring to hear the challenges that they're facing and to be in a position to offer some ideas about ways that we've managed those challenges and, and to reinforce to them that it's possible and getting kids back in school is, is an important thing. One other element that was 
less inspiring is the uh, budget concerns. Uh, so we've seen a budget projection for this year and uh, into 21-22, the state is expecting $1.6 billion in budget cuts necessary to balance the budget. And for 22-23, that's gonna get worse with an expected $2.2 billion shortfall. So we, we have managed okay this year uh, with our budget. Our enrollment has been stable. Uh, so we're, we're feeling okay this year. But just like the recession from uh, 2008, we didn't really feel the, the worst impacts of that until three or four years later. So we've got to stay vigilant in our budgeting. Uh, we've got to stay vigilant in, in, in making sure that uh, we use every dollar appropriately and uh, be grateful for the support from our community in keeping us financially healthy. Also, school visits and bus routes. Uh, I think it's important for me to see how all the systems are working uh, on the ground. Um, I'm seeing a lot more classrooms utilizing live broadcasts between classrooms, which I think is a great idea. It maximizes the content expertise of, of some of our teachers and shares or distributes the responsibilities for direct instruction among all those different teachers in grade level. Uh, it gives teachers a little bit of a break too so they're not on stage uh, all the time so that they're sharing that responsibility among grade level uh, peers uh, in teaching. I'm seeing mostly that in, in elementary schools, but more and more uh, I'm seeing that, that skill. Um, one other point to, to mention, and you've probably seen this in the Vail Daily, in, in riding school buses, uh, we need more drivers. We desperately need more drivers, and uh, we're offering some hiring incentives. We're offering some incentives for folks who stay with us through the whole year. So we've got a budget to fix this problem, but what we need are people who are, are willing to, to do the work, who either have the, the commercial driver's license or are willing to be trained, because we'll, we'll handle that piece as well. Uh, but it is, a, it is a huge need for us. We have barely just enough drivers right now to handle our existing routes. Uh, so as we start to add field trips or, or travel for athletics, it's going to get really challenging. So if anybody out there wants to drive a school bus, give me a call. Uh, are we getting pretty good ridership for the, the student-wise? Ridership is not bad. It started out the year noticeably lower than it had been in previous years, uh, but it, they're starting to trickle back in. And uh, afternoon ridership is definitely much higher than, than in the morning. And we've had to change up and consolidate some routes where we've had lower ridership to uh, provide greater capacity at areas where we have normal ridership. So it's a, it's a constantly dynamic situation. But if we had a few more drivers in the mix, it would, it would make our world a little easier. I wanted to make sure the board was aware that we are applying for the RISE grant. Uh, the RISE grant was offered by the state, uh, Governor Polis specifically. Uh, it's, it's over $32 million total in that fund, and districts can apply for anywhere from uh, $250,000 to $4 million. And our, our intent in applying for this is uh, to make sure that we've got all of our students engaged, especially those who are learning from home or remotely. It's intended for, there's three, three types of schools or districts that can qualify for it. One is if you're rural. Uh, Eagle County Schools has just enough students uh, that were not technically qualified as, as rural. Uh, the other one would be if you have a school on turnaround, and we don't have any schools on turnaround. But the third way is the way that we qualify, and that's if you have significant gaps in achievement. So under the achievement gap qualification, uh, we, we certainly can demonstrate that in our district. So under that, uh, we've, we're working on this application to submit in mid-October, hopefully for um, a note in November as to whether or not we get these, get these dollars. So I wanted you to be aware that we are working on that application. And finally, I just wanted to share an election update. This also from the uh, superintendent conference. Uh, Case, the Colorado Association of School Executives, has uh, issued formal statements indicating that they support both EE and Prop B. EE is the nicotine tax, and we'll see that on our agenda later in our meeting, and the Gallagher repeal. The Gallagher repeal is uh, intended to 
improve revenue to state budgets and it transitions the property tax burden from businesses more to, to residential. That got very lopsided in the last 30 years since Gallagher has passed and uh, it needs to be uh, remedied. So you're gonna see Gallagher repeals at all levels uh, at the state level, at the county level, at the municipality level. So uh, now that this is an option, everybody's pursuing it. Case formally opposes two propositions, 116 and 117. 116 is an income tax reduction. Uh, it's about a tenth of a point reduction in, in overall income tax, but if that passes, it significantly reduces state revenue. So as I mentioned previously, we're looking at a $1.6 billion shortfall in state revenue for next year, 2.2 the year after that. If this passes, that deficit gets even larger. And Prop 17 is voter approval for fees. This one gets a little convoluted, but it r really if, if you go back to the hospital provider fee, that was a hot item a couple years ago. Uh, the state was trying to decide, is that legitimate money? that the state gets to keep, or is it actually a quote tax, which would put it under the Tabor umbrella and mean that it was collected illegally because the voters never approved it. Remember that was a big fight we had a couple of years ago in the state legislature. So they're trying to prevent fights like that in the future and say uh, that the state does not have the ability to issue more fees or create more fees unless voters approve it. So it's really an extension of Tabor to make sure that voters have an opportunity to approve fees just as they would taxes. And uh, cases opposed to that because fees are one way that the legislature still has the ability uh, to generate some revenue outside of Tabor and they're so hamstrung by, by the Tabor laws themselves that they need any wiggle room that they can find, uh, which is um, why they wanna keep that, that latitude and, and case opposes 117 because of that. So that's the legislative update from the case perspective and the end of my report. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you very much, sir. Dr. Long, would you like to start with your board report? Sure. Uh, my daughter, uh, Tori, and I uh, went to uh, Eagle River Cleanup in Minturn. We were there for maybe two and a half, three hours, just uh, picking up with a small, small group of people from the college. Um, along the river as you go into Minturn. Uh, it, was a, it was a fun community thing, and I, I think they cleaned up almost all of the, the river on that day with a bunch of different groups. <clears throat> I also met with a woman, uh, Lauren Hassan, and she has a uh, consulting kind of uh, girl empowerment movement where she uh, wants to, she wants, we're trying to find a way to incorporate her into our equity training at CMC, and her, her kind of uh, shtick is, teaching um, young girls or, or recent college graduates how to uh, negotiate for a better salary. And it's, it's a thing, it's, a, it's not a skill everybody has, but she has had to deal with it in a lot of different areas. And she has a kind of a conference workshop thing put together where um, she can show pretty quickly how to, how to improve those skills and get those skills. Uh, CMC, the college where I work, um, we had an advisory council recently and that's where community members come and we talk about initiatives that are in different industries. Um, also, I met with the executive director and board member a separate board member of Mountain Youth uh, this week, and we were talking about maybe some ways that we can collaborate between Mountain Youth and, and uh, CMC. Uh, yesterday, I went to a PAC meeting. That's a professional advisory committee uh, in Aspen uh, on the college campus there. A PAC meeting is uh, where we get input from the local industries about whether our um, programs are meeting the goals of entry level positions. So in this case, it was media design professionals. Uh, we look at the student work, we look at what's happening in the industry, and we try to co coordinate our uh, offering, course offerings, so that uh, when those students graduate, they can move right into entry level positions in the industries. That was a, that was a good, strong, good, strong meeting as well. Also, our good friends at High Five Media, I met with them uh, earlier today. We're talking about ways that we can collaborate on the eSport initiative. I know how to play the game and work the video games uh, console, but I don't know how to stream it live over Twitch and uh, hold tournaments that way. So uh, 
uh, Arjun and uh, JK have agreed to help me with that part of it. And also they've agreed to uh, record the games and put them out for outreach to other students so that we can try to get more eSport initiatives going. And that's it for me. Thank you. Uh, since we met last, I got to have my first visit at the uh, new Edwards Early Learning Center um, a couple of weeks ago now. Got to meet with our prevention specialists and Robin Madison and a team that's working on how to um, bring in the safe and resilient schools work into the schools. Um, so that was a really exciting conversation and something I'm really interested in. On Mountain Youth, we launched our family education season for the year with our first Eat Chat parent and then our first Aprendiendo Juntos via Facebook Live and um, had a really good turnout. Both were topics focused around uh, parenting through the pandemic and how to support children and, and work in partnership with schools. Um, I got to attend a mandated reporter training. So that was a good reminder on how that process works. Um, and another training I got to attend was on white privilege that was delivered through the Vail Valley Partnership and it's part of a series. Um, I got to do a few school visits. I got to go with uh, Mrs. Cotrovella over to Vail Ski and Snowboard Academy for a staff meeting. And then I also got to visit at Avon Elementary with Principal Harrison. That was really great to get to see um, how they've creatively uh, designed drop off in the morning in a way that's safe for the children and the school. Um, I got to tour the school and see almost every classroom and like Mr. Qualman mentioned, got to see how they were using the live virtual system even from down the hallway just to maximize the impact. Um, also got to speak a little bit about the impact that um, the June Creek consolidation has had and to learn more about some of the software that they're using within the building. So that was a great visit and really appreciate um, Dana Harrison having me over. Um, and then um, a recent endeavor, I was inspired by my colleague, Dr. Long over here. If something's got you up at night, get involved. And so I spent some time over the weekend becoming certified to help with voter registrations and then um, got to spend a few hours on Monday at Eagle Valley High School helping to register students to vote. Um, and it was a great learning experience. I learned a whole lot about the process and eligibility and then really just amazing conversations with students. There are so many questions out there and I think often our young people don't realize the impact of their voice. So we are 41 days away from the election and so just encourage everyone to make sure their voter registration is up to date, correct address, all that jazz so that they can um, be all ready to go in a couple, the next couple weeks here. Thanks. Uh, well, I started this mor the morning at our Red Sandstone Elementary School, a staff meeting with Mrs. Ketcherella, and it was great to go there and check in with the staff. That was where my kids graduated from, so it's always had a special place in my heart. Um, but uh, I think the teachers are really, really excited to be back in the classrooms. They're very grateful to the supports they're providing. Um, they talked a little bit about that Wednesday and how essential that day is for their planning. Um, and how really that day is actually busier than even the days with the kids, that they hit the ground running. And I actually showed up to the staff meeting this morning at about 8 or 7.57. I was supposed to be there at 8, and I walked in, and the meeting had already started. I guess they started at 7.30, they hit the ground running. So they, they are working their tails off. Um, and all, I think, you know, we're a little overwhelmed, but also, uh, again, grateful to be with the students. And... Uh, yeah, it was super fun to get in there and see. Um, and then I am on the um, committee, the campaign committee for Yes for 5B. Um, if you want to find out any information, the easiest way is to go to the EFEC website, efec.org, and there's a couple of huge links, a big button at the top. Um, but as Superintendent Qualman was talking about earlier, budget constraints currently and in the future are uh, going to be a big issue. Uh, so that securing that money for the future for planning is essential to the district. So if anybody's interested in getting involved, um, again, I suggest going to the website and there's links to how you can get involved. Um, Sunday, we did participate on, I think, what they called Ninja Sunday. And so we put out signs. So we all went to June Creek and we went to, I live in Eagle Vale, so I went to that community and called the friends that I have and said, can I put a sign in your yard? And we went and we put up signs. Um, so hopefully uh, 
that will uh, be a successful effort on our part, and that is all that I have to report. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, first and foremost, thank you very much for uh, last meeting. I saw the recording, and I, I was like, oh, man. <laughs> so I couldn't make it, but thank you very much for your kind words. It, it truly means a lot. Um, on that same note, the... Board of Commissioners reached out to me and they want to publicly uh, give me the something, <laughs> the, the recognition. There you go. <laughs> I missed the words. Uh, on October 6th, so any and of you all invited, it's at 10 a.m. I don't know if I'm supposed to be inviting people, but here I am. <laughs> so October 6th is going to be at the Eagle County building. And uh, the email says that there was plenty of room to have social distancing and follow the COVID uh, restrictions. So uh, here it is. Um, there's that. So thank you very much for it. And then also for some of the things I've been doing, I thought uh, QPR, question per se, refer in Spanish uh, a couple of weeks ago. And my partner Lou was uh, able to attend there. So hopefully she liked it. Uh, and everyone who was there as well. So thank you for going over. Uh, what is it? Last week... Uh, Thursday, Friday, I believe, I uh, went and did uh, maturation classes to Homestead Peak School and Gibson Creek Middle School, and I, I don't know, I love it. It's 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 a lot of fun. It's uh, it's funny to say the least, but you know, it's an uncomfortable class that teachers say they don't want to do it. So I'm like, yeah, give it to me. Why not? So it, it was great. I, I had lots of fun. So hopefully um, everyone's happy with the, the work we did. And um, let's see what else. Uh, I did my first GDL or graduated driver's licensing laws virtually last week as well or a couple weeks ago. Hmm, I don't know what they were. I think it was this week. So uh, we did it virtually. Uh, I had the uh, uh, quite a bit of uh, interest on it. So th there were a good seven or eight participants. So it was a um, combination with uh, parents and um, teenagers. So we had a lot of questions. So hopefully we'll keep this going and, and get more questioning from uh, those young adults, uh, young drivers. And then on Saturday, this next Saturday, the 26th, is coming up the mental health first aid class in Spanish. So if any of you know anyone that wants to take mental health first aid in Spanish, please sign up. Uh, you can do it through uh, Speak Up Reach Out, through Sonia Mejia, or you can just call me or text me, send me an email, and I'll, I'll be able to send you a sub. It's going to be in Spanish only. So I think that's it for now. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so like Fernando said, I took the... Um QPR class that was put by uh, Hearts Rain, Los Corazones Reinan, and Speak Up, Reach Out. That was a great class. I learned a lot. I feel like it gave me some tools to hopefully help some people. Um, I've been distributing some of the um, ES on 5B uh, ER signs the last couple of days. Um, it's so weird. I, was, I tried to get on the meeting last week, and I clicked on the link, and I waited with two other people for like... 20 minutes, and finally we hung up, and I talked to uh, Tessa after, and we don't know what happened, but <laughs> I could not make the meeting, so I distributed some signs since I couldn't make it to the Ninja Sunday. Um, I've also been helping at uh, Eagle Valley Elementary with recess duty, um, with the PTA, we tried to put together, that's the only help they're taking from parents now, like nobody can really go in the building, but um, we kind of put together like a weekly sign up and, you know, any time you can go for half hour, that's half hour that the teachers get to plan or <laughs> eat lunch. So um, they've all been very thankful, and I've been having a great time just playing with <laughs> kinder and first grade. And um, what else? Oh, this week I volunteered for the first time at the community market, and uh, that was a great experience, such a cool place that helps so many families. I was just there. Um, you know, the trucks come in the morning from Costco and Walmart and City Market, and you just got to sort of go through the food, make sure everything looks good, and then you stock the shelves. But then I also got to uh, speak with a lot of families, and, you know, just it was a, a great experience. I'm looking forward to um, doing that on hopefully a weekly basis. And that's it. <laughs> uh, let's see. I attended... Works. Attended Battle Mountain High School accountability, uh, where Principal Parrish talked primarily about 
the COVID um, plans that are in place and how that's been going. Um, I wanted to give a shout out to Pavon Kruger, who took that over this year. Um, Carol Kruger, her sister-in-law, had been doing it for several years, but had her um, students had all graduated. So Pavon has stepped into that role. Um, and then I attended the Battle Mountain High School underclassmen awards. So that was virtual for parents and the kids were actually in the auditorium, which I thought was a clever way to do it. Um, I attended the Walking Mountains board meeting. I think their biggest excitement right now is um, that their employee housing opened, which has been a, a big project and a long time coming. Uh, they also have plans in place because as a district, we are not having um, field trips. Uh, the Rocky Mountain staff will be going to schools instead and doing those programs uh, closer to home on site. So that's good news. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to echo Phil's words of congratulations to Julieta Cavallo. Um, my 20 year old and 18 year old both had her for as a kindergarten teacher and she's fantastic. So <laughs> great work, Julie. <laughs> Great. Thanks, everyone, for all their their hard work. Um, I mean, got to go to a couple staff meetings, the PSSA and Red Sandstone Elementary, and uh, already the themes come out. And uh, it's all about gratitude. It's, uh, uh, the teachers are happy to be back in schools. Family are happy to have their kids back in school. Um, just really, you know, wanting helpful, happy that they're working together and they're being able to overcome obstacles and, and have really a lot of good learning from their school improvement plans. I was really impressed by the amount of silver linings people are able to come up with. Um, but I, and I just want to reiterate that I'm really grateful for all the work that everyone's doing all, all the way from at all levels. There's no way to express thanks to like every single person, which is what we're trying to do with the staff meetings. But I mean, I know that everyone is just above and beyond, especially the district team having to work through crises on the weekends, the tech team continuing after a summer with a relentless summer, continuing to work through problems, all the teachers and public health. And Superintendent Qualman explained to us how much public health is working to work with us uh, over time to make sure that we're doing the proper contact tracing and quarantining the smallest amounts of students and teachers that we can. So uh, thank you. Just hang in there, everybody. Hopefully we'll have a nice smooth October break and you can get some, some rest and enjoy some beautiful fall weather. It's pretty ideal out here right now. Um, that's about it besides the meetings. I got to stack two cords of firewood. One of my very favorite jobs. Very. No, it's actually kind of big responsibility. It can't fall over. My friend said her husband didn't hit fell, his fell over. <laughs> I'm going to go check it out. Um, I'm going to roll into the old and new business here, and um, we'll continue with our uh, board self-evaluation as we do every other meeting, and then um, we'll have three more school improvement plans, which we're just so appreciative of the time that the principals spend to do that, and just know it's part of what they need to do in order to, to look at their big picture, but then to come here and share it with us is a, another time out of their day, and... Uh, but it helps us really to get to know and learn the school so well, so we really, really appreciate it. We'll be talking more about COVID. I like how Dave Russell didn't, couldn't say it. He wouldn't say COVID. <laughs> he just kept saying March and alluding to it. I'm like, yeah, I don't, I don't like saying it either. But it's part of our new reality, and so we're working on planning and accommodations, consistently tweaking our plans to keep everybody learning. And then we'll have a bunch of resolutions in uh, th th thanking our staff which really isn't enough. I still try to do it every single time. I want just the staff to know how much we appreciate them. Um, we'll have the CASB voting delegates on proposed resolutions. We should uh, get that information in ahead of time. Where's that book? You'll get it from CASB. We'll get it. And I'll also put it in the packet. It'll, so it'll probably be in the, just in the packet. Then sometimes we have it like a month ahead of time, but. So you will receive it in an email from CASB? Um, as well as I will put it in the uh, next meeting packet. All right, is there any questions on anybody on how that works? It's, uh, have we, did we do this before? I'm trying to think what month we're in. We're in October. You guys are almost to the end of your first full year as board members, but this is a new thing. So, Casby, the delegates are able to, you want to explain it? 
<laughs> <Better than me. laughs> um, different boards can put forward resolutions of, of the platform for what CASB, like how K supports certain things. We get the CASB is going to have their platform of what we support, what types of legislation, what sort of changes. And then so some of them are standing resolutions like we have here. We need more time and more money and more teachers kind of thing. And then other ones are new that are put forward. And so we have the opportunity to vote. And then when we send our legislative representatives, they'll vote on it. But the board works together to read these and then give input to our legislative reps. And then they, um, CASB puts together their platform for the next session, which will, should run from January through May, right? If it's not disrupted. So we'll have plenty of time to talk about that next time. It seems like there's a ton of stuff on here, but some of them aren't going to be really very long. And then we have um, the early childhood visit from Shelley Smith and a housing update, and then some monitoring reports, just keeping on top of our policies <clears throat> and seeing how things are going. Is there anything else that we need to know or want to learn about or put on the agenda for to discuss soon? We're going to be getting the Healthy Kids Colorado data on an agenda, so we can talk about that. Probably the second meeting of October, which is not on this list right here. I guess a couple of things. Uh, two of the uh, principals tonight were talking about um, revisiting or revising their uh, grading practices. And I think I know what that means <laughs> for for where I'm at, but I, I maybe I'd like some more detail on that. Or, uh, you know, because I got, kind of got the sense from... Uh, from uh, uh, Mr. Russell that they were looking at it through an equity lens and I don't I guess I'd like to know what that process is you know how they go because grading's huge you know it's a huge uh, it's a huge part of it and it does need to be equitable also needs to be rigorous you know so I guess I'm interested in finding out more about uh, what that means to go over your your grading practices <clears throat> We can do an update on that for sure. Uh, when, when Tia Luck returns from maternity leave uh, later in October, that's when she and I are going to initiate that process again uh, district-wide. Okay. So it, it will be probably mid-year that we can come up back with, a, with an update. But uh, Missy, can we make, make a note of that? Thank yes. you. Great. Any other questions or new items to add or someplace we want to revisit? Right. Excellent. So, our COVID-19 planning update from the team. All right, I'll kick this off. So first, just a situational awareness. Uh, since our last meeting, we did have one uh, positive student case of COVID at Battle Mountain High School, and that has impacted 55 students and five teachers who are now all working remotely until September 30th. Uh, we also had another case uh, of a support staff member at Eagle Valley Middle School. Uh, but that person uh, is quarantined and there's no other impacts at that school for students or staff. So um, I think that's, that's good. Two incidents in, in the last two weeks, limited number of students impacted and uh, the Gypsum Creek crew is back and they're, they're back in person and, and doing well. A couple of other points to, <clears throat> to share. As these cases present and we have to make changes in programming, uh, there's some lessons that we have learned as a district leadership team and as an organization about how we manage these. Uh, I think first and foremost, we're at a point now where we've written enough of these le letters that, that we have some templates in place, and those templates have all the, the pertinent information, and we've recognized where those places are that would need to be edited each time, uh, which is going to make for a much more efficient and timely process and consistent process as well, so we know from letter to letter that we're making sure we're providing the same information. Uh, it also helps us share the workload. Uh, these things don't tend to happen between 8 and 5, Monday through Friday. We tend to work on these things late in the evening and on weekends for some reason. Uh, and, and we're all trying to have other parts of our lives outside of work. So if somebody's traveling or somebody's on the road, the fact that we are developing templates makes it a lot easier for somebody else to jump in uh, who, who has the ability or the time. Uh, so as a team, we're definitely sharing the responsibility in this and trying to develop systems so that, that we become interchangeable in, in that process. One of the big challenges that we recognized in the Battle Mountain incident is that there are families with two kids at the school. And in trying to communicate which one was impacted, 
it, it was difficult. So we had 55 students impacted. Um, and not all of them had siblings that were in the school, but a few of them did. So parents would receive two letters, one that says your kid is impacted and one that says your kid isn't. <laughs> And which one is it, right? But we have to be confidential about who it was that, that had the positive case. So uh, our only solution to that is to really uh, implement a, a much more complicated communication system. That would be a mail merge. So we, we know the students who are impacted. We have their ID numbers. And we can generate uh, mailing lists from that. But we're going to have to mail merge actual individual letters for each of those impacted families so that we, we don't have that confusion. Uh, we did put a note in the letter at home that said, if you're unsure, call the front office. And then the front office got bombarded with calls. So um, it, it, it's going to challenge our, our goal of efficiency and timeliness to do it that way. Uh, but I think it's important that we get accurate information to, to parents. Uh, a couple other system pieces to point out. Um, we are uh, we are going to be using a, a fresh text message group for each one of these incidents. Uh, what we've discovered is that as a district leadership team, we have a text group, but then we also have one that will run with public health and one with the principal, and we have too many happening at the same time. So for each incident that we have, we will have a, a, a special text group that we create for each one. That includes me, the principal, uh, Melissa and Katie, who support many of our schools, uh, Dan, who manages the messaging side, Sandy, in case there's implications for facilities uh, or transportation, and then Adele, who manages subs, so there's always a sub implication, so she needs to be engaged. And then Taylor Lower, who is in Dan's communication department, is, uh, is a ninja with Power School and, and with uh, School Messenger, so she can handle that technical side. And Eric Martinez, uh, because we always need translation. So that is, uh, what, 10, 10 people? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10 people <laughs> for each one of these incidents that are engaged in that work at crazy hours. So. Um, it, it's, a new, it's a new strategy for us to try to make sure that we're all hearing the same message and, uh, and on the same page. One other piece for consistency's sake is the development of an individual checklist for every time one of these incidents occurs. Uh, we find that each one of these, we think of something else that we wish we had done the last time. So we're, we're taking all those good ideas and best practices uh, including them into this checklist so that when we start that new text group, we also start a new checklist and make sure that we're thinking of every single element so that we have a consistent, comprehensive plan when we're managing these. So just like everything else this year, we're, we're learning as we go. Uh, we're perfecting as we go. But I have to say, as a team, I really appreciate the, the, the thoughtfulness and the, the, the time that has... Uh, that people have been putting in from, from my team and, and principals engaging in, in weird hours. It's hard, but it's, it's, the, it's what we have to do. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dan. Dan is going to share with you some updates to the key performance indicators. I'm going to give you a paper version of the, the KPI that the state is now utilizing. And uh, you can follow along with that as Dan shares more details. Uh, good evening, board. Uh, the county, uh, Eagle County and uh, Eagle County Public Health, has adopted the new statewide um, metrics that measures uh, a, a community's relative health compared to uh, the presence of COVID in it. Uh, it's similar to what the, the, our county developed, uh, except that it has five categories instead of just three categories. So in your handout, you'll see that we have um, categories that range from green, blue, yellow, orange, and red. Uh, previously, we just had the three color uh, options. Uh, and if you notice at the top, there's an overlay of the governor and the state's uh, categories, broader categories of, of uh, where we're at as, as a state, the stay at home, safer at home, <laughs> and protect our neighbors uh, categories. So we've got a, we've got two layers of information there. Uh, for the beginning of the adoption of this program, the state has placed Eagle County in the yellow uh, two concern level, uh, as indicated on the graphic. Uh, this is expected to be a temporary position. Uh, we need 14 days of improving, which is declining. Uh, case information in order to move down to the level one cautious. Um, it, it's really interesting that 
A lot of our data in Eagle County is in the green and blue categories already. Uh, so if, if conditions stay as they are, we will likely move into that blue level and or the green level. Um, the thing that we need to emphasize is that in the protect our neighbors phase, uh, we're still required to social distance and independent of this uh, graphic is the governor's face covering orders, uh, which are, are he's renewing now on a monthly basis. Uh, but it is those two factors, the, the face covering and the social distancing uh, that provides our community, our staff and students the most protection and is essential to keeping us into school. So as, a, as uh, the school district is receiving this information, we're in the process of developing a communication plan about it uh, to share out with the community. I can answer any questions on our new uh, dial for COVID. Uh, there has been an article in the paper about it. <laughs> Um, and information is starting to be disseminated through other public information officers. Right. I think the important thing that we're answering questions when we're talking to teachers, like when are in families, when are we going back? Well, until social distancing and masks and, and we're nowhere near that and then we'll have a month at least of planning to work on the transition and we, since we don't know what's going to happen, we, we don't, I don't want to be pessimistic about the whole situation, but we could be in blue for a while. And even green doesn't mean, right, that we're not uh Yeah, green is, uh, most importantly, is green is not a return to normal. There are still, it's, it's really a lessening of restrictions as you go down the dial. Uh, but the primary restrictions of the social distancing and the masking uh, is, is likely to continue um, for some time. And um, the modified in-person instruction model that we're in is to accommodate that social distancing. So that's what, that's kind of the driving force behind our ability to keep students safe. And really, if you think about it, we've probably had uh, four or five positive cases uh, affecting our schools and maybe uh, 150 to 170 uh, transition to remote, but out of 8,000 staff and students, that's, that's a pretty good management and containment of, of COVID in our community. So the good news is, is that those safeguards do appear to be working. Any other questions for Dan? Thank you, sir. Thank you, board. I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Jarno. She's going to take us down the roller coaster ride that is Chassa and how that has impacted sports and activities in our community. Are you ready for some football? Uh, yeah, this has uh, been my primary focus for the last week or so. Um, after a lot of back and forth and uh, conversation with uh, other schools in our league, um, we have decided, obviously, as you all know, to play football in the uh, A season, which is this fall. There were a lot of different factors that we looked at that was not an easy decision. Um, I think some of the pieces that we felt were important uh, one was that in terms of disease transmission, our community is in a really good place right now. Um, we don't know that we'll be in as good a place in March um, due to the influx of tourism and the ski season. And so since we are in a place where we can play right now, we felt that it was um, pertinent that we, we make that selection and that we play in the A season. Um, it allows our students to, to make sure that they, they get a season. We were um, sorely disappointed that Chassa was not also considering volleyball and soccer. Um, there's nothing we can really do about that except to express our displeasure to them, which we have. Um, so now we're working through the logistics practices um, have, will start tomorrow. Um, and our first games will be um, no earlier than October 8th. Um, Chassa is still finalizing the schedule. Um, some of the other factors that we considered were uh, transportation, as you heard earlier, 
uh, we are in, in dire need of bus drivers. So transportation is a big question mark right now. Um, for some of our other sports, um, for cross country and for softball, we've been relying in some instances on parents. Um, carpooling is not something that public health is super excited about. Um, exposing different uh, familial groups in cars uh, doesn't, they're not thrilled about that. But we're doing the best uh, we can with what we've got. Um, football presents a little bit um, different situation uh, in terms of the transportation and the need for a bus. Locker rooms are not um, being allowed to be used. So where do kids dress out then? Um, the football is, is a lot of equipment. There's a lot going on there. So um, in order for a family or a carpool situation, uh, not everybody has a Suburban. Um, so we're, we're kind of brainstorming that and trying to come up with some different ways that we might um, be able to address that, looking at the cost of charter buses, that sort of thing, um, which is pretty daunting when we think about it. Um, we are working uh, very closely with public health um, to address not only some of those issues, but also the issue of spectators. For the sports that we've had thus far, golf, cross country, um, and softball, the spectator um, section is not humongous. Um, and especially for cross country and for golf, um, they're, they're pretty spread out. But for football, that's a real popular sport that, that lots of people in the community want to be a part of. So we've been working with um, public health. We had a meeting today. We'll have another meeting on Monday. Um, and we're coming up with some guidelines in terms of um, what our community public health requires, what CHASA requires, um, and trying to get all of that taken care of. There are also a lot of other um, interesting thoughts that uh, keep coming up as we start working through this. Because locker rooms are not being allowed to be used, what happens in the case of lightning? Um, where do we go? Chassa has said that we can utilize gymnasiums for separate teams using social distancing, everyone masked up. What about the spectators? Most spectators will arrive in a vehicle, but not all. Um, so we're just working through all of those pieces. We have a, a running document. Uh, we're also looking into um, a ticketing system for spectators. Jason Butters in our IT department is looking into different systems for that. We would obviously be prioritizing the uh, parents of players. Um, dance and uh, sideline spirit are also approved. So we wanna make sure that those parents have an opportunity. And we've got to get all those folks in under the um, 175 person uh, guideline that we have from public health. So we're kind of working through all of those um, pieces and coming up with the plans. I had a really um, productive conversation, um, oddly, the uh, founder of Hope Squad, uh, his son is the principal at the Provo um, High School, Provo, Utah. They were the first high school in the nation to play football this year. And so he uh, has done a lot of this thinking for us. <laughs> so I was able to get in touch with him last Friday, had a really productive conversation and talked about how things um, went for them and things that they learned. Um, one of the, the pieces that he brought that was really important, I think, is if people feel disgruntled about what we need to do, that you have to wear a mask, that we have to have ticketing system, that there's only 175. The key um, phrase that, that really helped in his community was, this is what we have to do for our kids to play ball. And then people went, oh, okay, let me put my mask on. Uh, they did have one game that was stopped by the officials um, because people weren't wearing their masks and the athletes actually um, chastised the crowd and got them to wear their masks. So we're feeling pretty good about some of those things that, that, that will have a positive ending for that. Um, but it's just the, the details that we're, we're working through at this point. Any other questions? Like what was the motivation to not just play it in the spring? Like why was it so important to get it going? Or I don't so really yeah, a couple of things. Um, one was that we felt like if we passed up kind of the, the emotional and, and mental health toll that it would take on our students and our athletes, if we pass up the opportunity when we know we can do it now, and we pass that up and say we want to do it in the spring and then we can't do it in the spring, we're not assured that we can do it in the spring. 
but we know we can do it now. There are some concerns about um, the conditioning of the athletes right now that we, we don't have the same opportunities that we have if we start in August, um, but we don't know that that we will have any better opportunity in the spring, that that will be any better in the spring. As the weather gets worse, exercising outdoors gets harder, our indoor facilities get filled up, we're not confident that they will be in better shape in the spring, in March. Um, we also looked at the capacities for facilities, um, for um, our administrative capacities, for our administrators to be at all of the games and events, um, for scheduling, um, there are a lot of sports that are going to be happening in the spring. And so our space is going to be really, really crowded. Our transportation will be even more taxed uh, in the sea season than it will be now. Um, and so those were all pieces that, that fed into it. Um, I, I think the biggest, the biggest um, piece in my mind was really that um, where our community transmission is right now um, and the idea that if we pass up this opportunity and we don't have the opportunity in C season because of our community transmission and based on what happened last year um, with our tourist season, what happened over the 4th of July, um, kind of the feeling that, you know, we had hoped to do an in-person graduation at the end of July. And uh, we had a big surge due to 4th of July weekend and we weren't able to do that. And I don't think that we wanna have that same situation just for the well-being of our, our athletes. Um, and, and also, frankly, we felt like, you know, we because we are in a good place with our community transmission right now, we also felt like this could bring some joy to our community. Um, our, both of our, our high, major high schools uh, communities enjoy football. We will be live streaming it as well. There will be other opportunities if you're not a spectator in person to watch it. And we really felt like that was a boost that um, our community could really use right now. Can I just ask a question about, so districts that are choosing to go with football, so obviously if you're playing teams, are there many districts in the state at the moment that are playing football or how mm -hmm. does that kind of work with two seasons? It seems like you would have less, uh, less schools to play or, I mean, you know what I mean? Yeah, that, that was another um, piece that we kind of looked at was what would the competition, we kind of held back. Um, Chassa, we had to, um, you had to have your declaration done by eight o'clock on Monday morning. Um, and so we kind of waited over the weekend. We waited until like 7.59 to put ours in um, to look at what were other districts doing. Um, the majority of districts are playing in the A season. So they're playing this fall. Um, what we, another thing that we looked at of, of the districts that had uh, chosen um, by Sunday night, I think was the last time we kind of looked at it before we finalized it. Um, the, the majority were in the A season and it was gonna be better competition in the A season. And um, in, if we waited till the C season, we would be traveling quite a lot. Um, it was gonna be further away. The competition wouldn't um, be um, the regular teams that we usually play. The majority were gonna be in the A season. So we did look at that also. And the other fall sports, Chassa just wasn't ready to make a move on those, just maybe not quite as much pressure from the, from the parents, so it's not an option for us. We have to go by what they say. Yeah. Um, we, we, are, um, we have opened our fields and facilities to our clubs um, for the Vail Volleyball Club and the Vail Soccer Club and, and our rec districts to utilize for um, those sports, but Chassa uh, just wasn't having it. So for whatever reason, I don't know why that is. We did express our extreme displeasure to the commissioner. Thank you for that. Katie, thank you for that update. I th our last update on uh, COVID changes for this year is a fifth day update from uh, Melissa. Were we going to do a guest teacher one as well? Uh, no, I don't. Oh, she had to leave. Okay. Um, so today we're in the fifth, fifth day um, since we started fifth day programs. And uh, we're, our take rate is still not where we would expect it to be. We did start Mountain Rec today. Um, they had 10 students, so that's about 50% capacity for Down Valley. So the offering was available today. Um, all of our, 
or I would call our essential uh, worker facilities uh, with the, the licensed daycare now do have mixed cohorts. Um, and I don't know if that's affecting parents' decision to send or not, but um, so far, no incidences with the mixed cohorts. Everything's going great. Um, Vail Rec District did have 29, and they're still our biggest program. So families bringing their kids up to that area. I think probably it's a lot of families that work in the Vail area that are dropping their kids off there. It's mostly uh, three schools drawing that one now. And then um, Celebrate the Beat did a virtual um, camp thing today, but they only had two kids. So I think we need to look at, we have a meeting tomorrow, um, how we incorporate these more into um, some of the, the things that go out for parents. Uh, the, the website's up, it's going, people can access it. Um, but we're talking about doing a report kind of the first month back at school and then um, promoting those organizations a little bit more for families to make sure that um, people get the word out. And then another uh, celebration, it's not during fifth day, but Walking Mountains has been, um, it, they've done 59 different classrooms already um, for virtual or schoolyard field trips this year. So uh, again, thanks to all of our partners, um, some of our smaller partners uh, like Alpine Arts and those, uh, you know, they have to do it to make a little bit of a profit. So it's really hard for the partners right now. We appreciate their patience and we hope that we do get more families signed up as the offerings become easier to access. Thanks, Melissa. Any questions for her on fifth day programming? I'll give a, a, a quick update on our guest teacher situation since Adele had to step out. Uh, we have posted for some additional perm sub positions. So we intend to, to use our CARES dollars and our ESSER dollars and really prioritize those to hire more perm subs because we realize now that that's a, a choke point in our system. That, that could be an element that forces us to close schools. As teachers get exposed or they, they become ill, and they're out for two weeks, it's, it's really uh, a challenge. So we have those positions posted right now. We've got a couple people already on the line with some interviews pending uh, that we can start to, to move into some jobs right away. And similar to how we posted the positions for transportation, there are also some hiring uh, incentives for perm subs so that we can entice some more people to join us to help with that effort. That concludes the COVID update for tonight. Any other questions? Can I ask one? So, so qualifications for a permanent sub, what would that qualification be for an individual that wants to apply for that? It, it job? depends on how long they want their, um, their permit for, so you, or your license for. So uh, with a high school diploma, they can get uh, authorized for one year as a substitute teacher. And with a college degree, you can be authorized for three years. It does require a process with the Colorado Department of Education where you have to submit uh, fingerprints and do a background check through the Colorado Bureau of Investigation. And uh, we are willing to reimburse folks for all the costs associated with that up to, uh, I think it's about 100, between 130 or $180, depending on which license they go for. Uh, but the, the, it's not a fast process. Uh, but we can walk you through every step of the way and make sure that there's no cost associated for, um, for going through the process. Thanks. Mm -hmm. any, other, <clears throat> any other questions? <clears throat> um, that takes us to the student count data update. Superintendent Qualman. Okay, so enrollment projections and student count, we remain within 1% of our enrollment projections. So the result of that is uh, no major adjustments needed uh, to staffing or budgeting. Uh, again, the key phrase here is uh, cautiously optimistic. So we'll, we'll keep an eye on that in the next couple of weeks. I think the big date coming up is October 1. Uh, October 1 is our official count date, but it really is a window. So it includes the five days before and the five days after. So uh, starting tomorrow, actually, our window opens for, uh, for enrollment, and it will close Thursday, October 8th. And that does include Wednesdays, too. So when our kids are engaged in Wednesday, we can count them as part of that uh, 
attendance group. Uh, there are some new stipulations in the count this year for families who are students who have attended starting in August, but for some reason they're, they're out for the stretch of the window, like say for example, a quarantine or something like that. So any kids that have been in our schools from start day uh, up to the count window, uh, there are some provisions that will allow us to count them as well. So that is a bit of flexibility that CDE has provided for us this year. Um, I could say that on October 28th, uh, I'll provide a final report on enrollment uh, after the count concludes. I can't do it at our first meeting in October because the window would still be live. So um, I'll, we'll be able to provide that on October 28th. But we remain cautiously optimistic. Can't ask for more than that. So brings us to the third item under public interest items for discussion, and that is a resolution in support of EE on the November ballot. Would you like to walk us through that, Superintendent Coleman? Yeah, happy to. Uh, board members, you'll find the resolution actually attached in board docs. This is a, it's a proposition placed on the ballot by the state legislature, and it would incrementally increase cigarette and tobacco <laughs> product taxes and create a new tax on nicotine products uh, that are currently not taxed, like e-cigarettes and, and vaping products. Uh, so it would uh, incrementally increase uh, those taxes over time. And uh, the, the money, the revenue generated from this are intended for preschool programs, uh, state education fund, rural schools, uh, housing development grants, uh, tobacco tax, uh, cash fund, uh, tobacco education programs, and then ultimately state general fund. So. Um, I, I think that the taxing of the vape products and the e-cigarettes is huge. The fact that those products are not being taxed right now is, I mean, other than general sales tax, is pretty astonishing. Uh, also considering how popular they've become with young people. Uh, so the fact that we might get universal funding for preschool out of this is, is a huge deal. So uh, the, the resolution here is for our organization, Eagle County School District, and for you as board members, uh, to demonstrate your support for Proposition EE. Questions? Any questions or discussions? Um, Seems like a no-brainer to me with all the benefits that could come out of it. I would move to approve Resolution 2020-21-7 in support of Proposition EE on the November ballot. I'll second. A second. Oh, we got a bunch of seconds. <coughs> Mr. Almanza? Aye. Mrs. Alter? Aye. Mrs. Cacciarella? Aye. Mrs. Jarno? Aye. Dr. Long? Aye. Mrs. Stecker? Aye. Mrs. Tivarkunas? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Excellent. Thank you very much, Missy. E. All right. And as we see, we have Mr. Tom Braun here rolling in, getting set up with the computer to talk about our uh, 2020 facility master plan. That is correct. Right on and, time. And we, are, uh, we are ready. Looks like you're rolling through there. Yep, now I'm just trying to get to one particular page. We have no uh, formal PowerPoint tonight. We just have the plan up on the screen if we need to, uh, to refer to it. I'm going to try to be quite brief with my comments. Um, we spent time at your last meeting introducing you to the plan and walking you through the major elements of the plan. You got it in your packet, or I think you might have gotten it before the packet last week. Um, and so hopefully you've all had a chance to take a look at it. Um, <coughs> The plan, you know, the major takeaways, it's a pretty different situation than it was back in 2016. Um, our schools are all in great shape. In 2016, they weren't. Uh, that's a good thing. Um, we still need to maintain or continue our maintenance and improvement programs for our infrastructure, our buildings that we have to prolong their life uh, uh, for each of them. Um, we've got ample capacity in our schools. That's a function of what we did in 2016. It's also a, a function of forecasted declines in enrollment. We touched on this last week. Uh, we updated our enrollment and demographic report with the help of Shannon Bingham, our demographer. Um, and the numbers are, are, are significant. You know, roughly 65, 6,600 kids today. 2027, 53, 68 is the forecasted number. That's roughly 18%. Um, Shannon will tell you that Forecasting enrollment right now is as difficult as it has ever been. Mm -hmm. Everything is volatile. We'll know more next month, next year, in two years. He thinks it may take that long for things to settle out. 
in mountain communities, he was seeing this volatility even before COVID. COVID is a factor with unknowns and uncertainties, but we were seeing a lot of changes in, res in resort communities. He feels primarily due to the cost of housing, employment opportunities, and people that should be staying here and raising families, leaving. Um, we'll get into that more in a little bit here. Um, Let's go to the recommendations. The plan speaks to four different topics where we address different recommendations relative to the facility master plan. Uh, the first one has to do with buildings, and we have updated uh, our inventory of all the schools and buildings, identified uh, literally hundreds of improvements that uh, are necessary. We've ranked them in terms of priority one, two, three, and four. Priority ones tend to be improvements that are needed right now to sustain the life of the building and help it last for a long, long time. Uh, priority twos are along those same lines. We just have a longer window of time before improvements need to be addressed. Uh, the ones and twos we recommend in the plan that starting this year and going into 2021, uh, your facilities and finance staff uh, work and drill down more closely into all these improvements. Um, this plan was done at a master plan level and as such, there are broad brush things about, you know, here's a problem, we can solve it this way, here's the approximate cost. We need to look at, you know, how can you really solve that problem, what is the real cost to understand real numbers, in some cases improvements might require some design work. So we need to get a better handle on cost. At the same time, we need to understand our funding availability to implement those improvements. Put those two together and see what we can get done. We had kind of a convenient situation in 2016 with the bond. We were able to tap in or include in that bond a large amount of money to address a lot of this deferred maintenance for our buildings. If and when we'll have that opportunity again, I don't think we know. Um, so we need to track on funding resources we have to implement these improvements. And then there could well be another round of further vetting of prioritizing what's really got to be done now and what can wait for uh, another year. Um, so that work would, should begin uh, basically right now. Uh, the other thing that we need to do is look at the finding a permanent funding source for our capital improvement fund so we have resources to address these kind of deferred maintenance items and not have to rely on COPs or bonds or, or, or what have you. Um, another major topic of recommendations is staff housing. We defer back in large part to the work we just did on employee housing plan, and a lot of those efforts are already underway to, to look at potential programs we could implement. In fact, I think Sandy's gonna come back to you at your next meeting with an update of what we're doing relative to Third Street and Battle Mountain uh, and it, as it relates to uh, housing, housing efforts. Um, we provide in the plan recommendations on all of our land resources. I think we have 17 or 18 parcels uh, that aren't developed. Uh, in a nutshell, all the sites identified and acquired uh, for school sites were holding for school sites. Notwithstanding the enrollment projections, we don't know what's going to happen five years or ten years out. We're not going to give up our land that could accommodate schools if and when they're needed. We identify a number of parcels for housing development that came out of the housing master plan, Third Street, Battle Mountain, Malloy Park. Um, and we've got a number of parcels to be, to be land banked. Uh, we are suggesting that that five lot subdivision we had preliminarily approved by the town of gypsum at the ik bar that we take some steps with that and potentially use the revenue from that land to fund other housing initiatives and that also came out of the housing uh, master plan under the uh the infamous other considerations category we get into some of the meat here whereas with the 2016 plan we were looking at growth we were looking at schools that needed to be fixed let's create more capacity, let's address schools. Now it's a matter of how do we respond to declining enrollments? Uh, and what does that mean? Uh, first of all, with the uh, volatility and the enrollment forecasting business that I mentioned a minute ago, um, every five years we've updated this report that's in the, in the facility master plan. We're suggesting that annually we work with Sandy and Shannon and monitor some of these key factors that influence enrollment. Uh, birth rates, housing starts, housing costs, employment levels, uh, overall population change in the valley. And if we see things that are telling us something, it might prompt us to revisit our demogra demographic report more quickly than waiting five more years. So just be more prudent and diligent about seeing what's going on out there, uh, particularly in the next couple of years, Shannon has, has, has emphasized. Um, and these are things that many of us other clients are, are, are doing the same thing to try to keep ahead of this as much as we possibly can. Um, 
the, uh, the other one has to do with school operations. And the amount of kids you have in a school directly affects the efficiency of how well that school operates. Um, the fewer kids you have, the more your costs to operate that building have to be uh, covered by less revenue from the kids that are in that, in that building. Um, what Shannon has indicated that as a general rule of thumb, if you're at 60% of your capacity, if you're below 60%, you're likely going to start running into problems of building inefficiency and, and, and cost to run that, operate that building. You guys took the bold action last year of taking June Creek and converting it to an early learning center and sending those kids to Edwards and Avon Elementary. At that time, those schools were roughly in that 50% range of their capacity versus their enrollment, and you were able to make that happen. What we're suggesting in the plan is that we evaluate all of our buildings, look and see about where are their inefficiencies, wh what buildings are running well, which ones are not, maybe uh, establish some metrics or benchmarks in terms of the average cost per student to operate the building. And when we get to a certain level, that can be an indicator that, gee, we need to look at this situation. Uh, but to be prepared and understand how the buildings work uh, relative to how they might be able, be able to be addressed if we see declining enrollments. Um, and, and what that means to the operation and efficiency of each, of each school. Um, looking at the 2027 projections, we're going to be at an average of about 61% capacity uh, throughout all of our schools. Um, the range is between 38 and 84% capacity. Um, so we've got some schools that are going to be doing pretty well relative to, that, to, to their operations. Others are gonna be below that 60 and even 50% uh, capacity. So we need some things to, there are some things we need to do to keep our, our eye on, on the school operations as it relates to, to enrollment. Um, energy efficiency related to cost. Uh, the district back in 2006 started taking steps to improve the energy efficiency of their building. In 2016, there were a number of things done uh, to further uh, the energy efficiency of our buildings. Um, the district is a member of the Eagle County Community Climate Action Collaborative, and through working with that group, uh, they are also involved in what's called the B3 Benchmarking Program, and Sandy and uh, Aaron and her team are working with uh, Walking Mountains to monitor our energy, energy use for each building and track that to identify where they might need to address uh, and, and improve the efficiency of how our buildings are, are operating. Um, that is the extent of or a quick 10 minute overview of where we're at with the facility master plan and how we can hopefully use it to guide us over the course of these next couple of years relative to how our buildings operate and how they're going to perform uh, for us. Um, Michelle, you asked a specific question about how the heck do these demographers uh, forecast birth rates. Uh, I put that question to Shannon. His first response to me was, how much time do you have? Um, but what he did was he applied a blended linear regression. And he just said to say that with confidence, and you probably wouldn't ask any more questions. But he, he, took, he took the decline that we've been seeing and projected that he softened the curve a little bit because it just can't continue to go down to zero. Um, and he said if you had 10 demographers look at our situation, you'd probably get 10 slightly different forecasts on what the birth rates might be. Uh, but that was the, the quick answer to his question. Shell, you asked last time about uh, security initiatives from 2016. Most of those big picture items were addressed. Uh, the current uh, improvement uh, plan identifies things like improved fencing around ball fields, in a couple of cases improving the, uh, the automated uh, access control systems at doors, installing or upgrading cameras and software in some of the schools. So the bulk of those things were taken care of in, in 2016, but there are some left to take care of with this, with this next round. So with that, I haven't taken up all of our time already. Um, I'll be happy to answer any questions that you, you might have. <clears throat> well, I guess the good point about the, the birth rate and the projections is that if we're really keeping closer tabs on it every year instead of every five years, well, you can just go with the actual reality of the birth rates because we don't see them till preschool, kindergarten, so we actually know the three years that that will be really important for us to keep close tabs on this and then just as far as people moving in. I don't know that Shannon, our demographer, can quantify it clearly, right. but his belief is the single biggest factor that us and 
Sun Valley and Jackson and Aspen are facing is the affordability or lack thereof of housing. That's where we're just seeing this outward migration of people that used to stay here and raise families like most of us, us, us did. So maybe some of the work we're doing with our housing plan will actually help our, our situation in the long term because we're going to create this housing initiatives all over that are being created. And we'll, and we'll see if it helps or not. But I really support the keeping an eye on it, much closer tabs than ever before. Because I have a question about um, Malloy Park. If you can, um, I don't have a lot of history with it. I know uh, what we when we first got on the board here, it was a there was a, a major concern, mostly with ha maybe having to move people out and all that. Can you tell me what the hangups are or what the short term plan is for Malloy? Um, I don't know if I use the word hangups so much as the, I would use the word challenges uh, with that site. We've got the opportunity to facilitate the development of up to 120 additional homes uh, at Malloy Park. Uh, it's going to take a lot of work to get that done. It's basically doing a full-scale subdivision, improved water tanks and roads and sewer lines and that sort of thing. The housing plan still said, let's keep our eye on that. Uh, but it basically said, let's look at Third Street and Battle Mountain High School first. They're much smaller, more discrete projects, easier to wrap our arms around and easier to finance and, and get done. Um, so the housing plan said, let's keep looking at Malloy Park and see where that might, might end up. Um, so we'll be coming back to you with further discussion um, of, of Malloy Park and what it potential might have in, in, the, in the not too distant uh, future. Um, one of the things you're referring to was this development uh, and how it would affect the 15 or 16 mobile homes that are occupied by district staff currently. And that was, that was one of the uh, topics that came up uh, even before the housing master plan relative to what that bigger development would mean to those existing uh, staff members. Well, with an over 200 page plan, this seems kind of minor, but um, right at the beginning on page two, um, an edit would be great <laughs> for my last name and Fernando's first name I seem to be misspelled. Oh my Again, very minor in my the seriousness of the content of the entire document. But. I will talk to a graphic <laughs> layout person and speak to him immediately. Thanks. Thank you for catching that. It's all good. <laughs> any any other uh, any more questions? We had a very thorough uh, review of this at our last meeting, so we appreciate the final uh, Just update one and presentation. Mm -hmm. um, you talk a little bit about securing funding sources. Um, I mean, aside from going for. The t I mean, what are, what are the options for funding sources aside from, you know, a ballot initiative? There are a handful, and Sandy, go ahead and jump in here if, or take it. Sure. Um, so a lot of these items that we try to address um, annually through our capital reserve fund. And so generally what happens is we take a general fund transfer and we move it to capital reserve. We do about a million dollars a year. And so we would continue to do that to support the immediate needs as well as get into the priority one and two for as long as we possibly could. Um, but as far as taking care of the high dollar ones, the COPs or bonds would be the best or only option that we would have to, to address that. Um, when we look at the financial impact economically, as we planned our budget this year, we actually reduced our capital reserve transfer to keep as much um, in the classroom as possible in our forecasted years. So we'll really have to keep an eye on that and what we can do. But it's kind of the same thing that happened after the last uh, recession is that we had to take funds from capital reserves so we weren't able to maintain and then ended up with um, $140 million worth of <laughs> uh, bond questions. So um, it's just something that kind of ebbs and flows, but we do our best to maintain it. Okay, that's kind of what I thought, but it seems to be a challenge for sure. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> any any more discussion? Any other questions? This is an action item. I'll move to approve the 2020 fa facility master plan. Second. Further comments or discussion? No, oh, Missy. Thank you, Mr. Almanza. Aye. Mrs. Salter. 
Aye. Mrs. Cacciarella? Aye. Mrs. Jarno? Aye. Dr. Long? Aye. Mrs. Stecker? Aye. Mrs. T. Varkunis? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Thanks for coming. My pleasure. <laughs> Yep, keep us in line there. All righty, so we just wanted to touch base as the new school year began um, with the uh, GP7 in our committee structure, make sure that we're all on the right page with this. And oh, it's me. I was like, I wonder who's in charge of this. Oh, <laughs> that's me. So every um, CASB delegate and legislative network representatives is Shelley and Ted. Right, you guys are working together on that team, sharing the the load. What was the one we wanted to um, confirm, Shelley? The, the calendar committee. <coughs> That's Michelle and I, and we don't know when. When is the meeting? I can't wait. And then I think the CPP is what we were talking about, right? That and DAC. Were the two that, Fernando, were you thinking you'd jump on this preschool one? Uh, I believe I still am. I thought it was just after uh, last year you're going to be, and then I was going to take over. So um, I would love that. Until now, yeah, for <laughs> sure. Not that I didn't find it <laughs> riveting, but. <laughs> All right, so we're going to pull Shelly Jarno off of the. Colorado preschool. preschool program and the Head Start Policy Council, which is the same, even though it's listed twice, it's the same meeting. Um, yeah, Fernando, you're, you're gonna like it. It's, and it's bilingual. Yeah, it's they're good. It's good meetings. It's really great to see the uh, participation from the community and the families taking ownership of the of our preschool program. Um, and then DAC, when they were doing the switch on there, Shelly finished serving out last year's term, and Fernando will take over. And then I hope you don't have too many other committees, Fernando. Fernando, on that, if you do have, like, work conflicts or things that you can't go, I can go periodically. Like, if you're not going to attend, let me know. But it would be great if you can be there. No, for sure. I'll, I'll try to make sure that I, um, I'm more available this upcoming than I was last year, I guess. Okay. Um, so. <coughs> and then, I told Shelly that I was, I mean, I'm willing to do DAC too if you've got your hands full because I don't have my hands full at the moment. <laughs> so it, it's, a, it's up to you, but I had told Shelly that I would take over DAC too because it seems like it's a good way to stand I mean, it's a really good way to learn. Um, yeah. So, yeah. you know, just... I do think it's good to have a board member there at each meeting. So, I mean, there's no reason that two can't go, three yeah. can't go because of the three being in the same place well, at the same time. Do it but I'll plan to not be there yeah, unless nice. somebody tells me they're not going to go. It. So if you want to get the email about the dates and okay. things, that's fine. I mean, there's no limit. Is the deck calendar set yet? Yes. I would say that if, if uh, Kelly and I would like to talk about it and uh, look at the schedules and make sure that if, if there's a conflict uh, greater than, then I could probably talk to Kelly about it. But um, yeah, I'd be happy to share it. Right. I think it's good because those are two of the heaviest meeting loads of the committees because DAC meets twice a month for the first half of the year. And then the preschool advisory committee that has start um, yeah, policy council meets once a month. Preschool's all you. <laughs> for... Uh, so preschool is all you for sure, and then you guys can look at the preschools once a month. Um, once a month, starting in October though, and all the way through May. And, and just making sure, uh, for my sake, Missy, am I going to be able to get that uh, scheduled out or the the copy of the schedule? For DAC, you mean? For preschool, and then also the one that we'll discuss with Kelly. Certainly. So the DAC. Um, calendar is set, and I'll send that out here in just a few minutes. And then the preschool um, meetings have not been set and will be set later in October. And once those are set, Shelly will be in touch. Thank you. They, uh -huh. The way they did it last year is they actually had their first meeting. And at that meeting, they said, does the second 
Thursday and I, in every month work for you oh. kind of thing. So you could put your input as to what works for you. Oh. So. Perfect then. All right, and then the wellness committee is Kelly and Michelle. Yeah, but I, I haven't, I haven't actually been happened. on the wellness committee. I've sent a couple of emails, but somehow I've, I've not managed to get on the wellness committee, but I'm happy to attend. I'm super interested in it. And land resources is not a tremendous time commitment, so I'm happy to be on wellness, but somehow I never managed to get on it and sent a couple of emails. And I mean, things have been crazy, so I haven't done anything on wellness in the past year. How is facilities different than land resource? The Land Resource Committee basically deals with the assets and holdings of the district, but the Facilities Committee deals with the more day-to-day uh, -day requests, primarily from principals, on minor improvements that they'd like to make on their facilities. So have you been going to some So we, don't, we meet by email. Whenever somebody oh, comes up, if a, if a school has a request for an improvement, we get the plans and the specs and the form, and we discuss it over a group email and then they go ahead because it's stuff that just comes up with additions to a playground or a stage or a mural, different things like that. So just to get back and to- And yeah, back to wellness. Um, I believe we were pretty good about meeting consistently last school year, at least until the spring that thing happened. Um, and then we have met once, I think about a month ago or so and are back on track to be meeting quarterly, right? And then there's some committee meetings in between, and I plan to continue that representation, and especially with the hiring of the wellness coordinator. I think that's been a huge boost to have Dana on board and help coordinate those. All right, so should we get you, Kelly, on that, um, I mean, on the email? I'm happy to, to check but. it out. <laughs> I haven't, I haven't served on it, aside, aside from hearing what happens in the board meetings. I'm not well-versed, but definitely interested and happy to uh, serve on that committee. All right, we just want to make sure we balance, we balance it out. We don't want to be doubling up and having two members attend meetings if we don't need two members right, and making so, sure yeah. that no one's feeling they're getting overwhelmed by their committee work. So, but, so, is Adele, you're with that? Yeah. Oh, Melissa. No, goodness. Well, Kelly wants to be added onto the list. Well, and I wonder with so many subcommittees and all doing really important work, maybe we could share a list of those subcommittees with the whole board in case that's a manner that someone would want to get involved with. No pressure because that's not a requirement to have board representation on those, but there are they're doing really interesting work, I think. It would be Is good. That? I don't know much about it. So... Um, we could have a little update on what the 10 subcommittees are and what the work is that okay. they're doing. Yeah, maybe on our Friday update, we can get a list of the subcommittees and meeting schedules if they are consistent. And is that okay? Yeah, but Silver, did you not get an invite the last time I asked Dana to send you one? I have not really. I did get one email that just had um, some information. It wasn't an actual invite, but it did have some information, I think, with subcommittees and things, but it was. It was it was more like I read through it and there was some information, but I don't think I had any kind of actual invite. So, and I know things have been crazy, so no big deal. And I'm happy to help. Or if you guys are overwhelmed and it's more work to bring me in, <laughs> that's fine too. No, so, we'd love to have you. I just didn't realize you didn't get invited to the Yeah, no worries. And then, do we know what's happening with the gifted and talented? I forgot I was part of it because we never met. So. They, like, are they we doing used anything? to meet uh, <coughs> quarterly, and it was a regular meeting. And then they had tried last year to shift to sort of these more information sessions at the schools where the actual GT person was at the school and parents could come. And so I attended a couple of those, but they weren't very well attended by other parents. So if I had to guess, they're probably looking at that again and saying what makes the most sense and maybe switch back or I don't know, try something else. Um, but so far there, I haven't heard anything either. So. 
Um, so we'll get update on that facilities committee. I'm still with that. It works really well for me. And finance committee <coughs> quarterly. Mm -hmm. dun, dun, dun. And then the GT Head Start Policy Council land resource. And Kelly and Shelley have been able to do that. And then the SEAC, which is starting in October, we'll be hearing about that. Special education. And if Amy is here, she could tell us what was going on with these meetings, but uh, she'll be here next time. Everybody good? Is that all clear? Is mud? We get that? So I'll straighten out, Missy? Yeah, I believe I have it. I will go ahead and put the list together and put it in the update. So please read the update. If I have something wrong, please let me know because I will send your names out to the directors that are responsible for these committees and then they will send you invites. Okay. Thank you. That's good. Yeah, and generally we just do this every two years, but with the transition in the school year, it should be fine. So we, are we going to... Um, this is an action item, it says here, to approve it? Yes. Or should we wait till it, we've seen it all cleared up? Mostly we're just pulling Shelly off of some of the extra committees that she wanted to finish off the year last year. Yeah, it is. Um, you monitor this report once a year, okay. um, whether there's changes or not. So it's the, the approval of monitoring the report this evening. I move to approve the monitoring of governance policy GP-7 committee structure. A second. For their comments or discussion, thank you to all the members for their additional work. If you, these are our bonus meetings we get to go to in support of the work we're doing here in the district. Missy, we'll take the vote. Thank you. Mr. Almanza. Aye. Mrs. Alter. Aye. Mrs. Cacciarella. Aye. Mrs. Jarno. Aye. Dr. Long. Aye. Mrs. Stecker. Aye. Mrs. Tivarkunas. Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Thank you. All right, we had our personnel list on consent, and then we're here to the point of evaluating the board meeting in terms of governance policies. We just monitored our committee structure. Next time we'll have a lot more monitoring policies. It was, I was thinking about this. We, being parents and being involved, members of the community, and once you get in there, you, you want to be part of the work. But we have to remember that as the board, we're really just in charge of the policies and making sure that the work is getting done. And that can always be a little challenging to find that fine line of differentiation between being a member and being a parent or being a you know, tied closely to a partner organization. But I think we do really well with that overall as a board and, uh, and we appreciate the mindfulness that the board, uh, you, you know, uses while they're keeping all their hats straight. <laughs> uh, goals and mission of the district, we got our kids in school, so we're way ahead of the curve. And uh, again, appreciate all the hard work. I know you guys have been just burning the candle at both ends and we really appreciate it. And I hope you take some time for yourselves. Remember to uh, turn the phone off at least for a little bit at some point and enjoy this fall weather while it's still here. And then impacts on student learning today, maybe not for this meeting, except for the excellent work from the principals on their school improvement plans and how it's a dedication of our principals and, uh, and the teachers just getting those kids learning every day. Any final comments or questions from anybody here? I hate to let you all go so soon here at 7.30, but I will. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>